Good afternoon. Welcome to Source and the Physics um, and Engineering sessions. I'd like to get started with Aidan McKee, who will be presenting Developing Process Control Labs and Simulations to Increase Student Comprehension. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Aidan McKee. I, as she said, I'm an electronics engineering technology major here at Central Washington University. Uh, and today I'm going to be presenting about my senior project. I'm going to be talking a little bit about what my project is, the problems I'm trying to address with the project, the goals that I have, the research I did to get there, and kind of everything that I've done since then to make it happen. Yeah, the next one. Um, so my project is all about control theory, uh, focused on the class for my major called process control, which is EET 427. Um, and it also concerns a little bit of the two classes that precede it, uh, electrical networks and advanced electrical networks. Those two are about circuit analysis, not like computer networks. So make sure you kind of keep those two distinct for yourself uh, as I dig into it a little bit. Go to the next one. Um, so the biggest thing I'm trying to address is the disconnection from process control to our two networks classes. They're meant to be taken in and all address the same concepts, but in slightly different ways. So I, <laughs> having taken the class, realized there's a lot of problems with the way we present it. All of our, it's a very lab heavy class and it's all disconnected, fairly confusing and on a incredibly complex topic. There's definitely some things that could be improved upon. Uh, not only that, uh, globally, this is a problem for academics in general. Um, in fact, there are several federal grants to different institutions to try to provide educational material concerning this subject uh, because it is just that difficult to um, conceive in general. Uh, so you can go ahead to the next one. So to address these problems with our class, I decided that I wanted to rewrite some labs um, and develop supporting material for those that sort of tie in all of our previous classes and make them more accessible and understandable for the students that take it. Um, this material includes mathematical modeling, graphical modeling, and circuit modeling on top of sort of renovating the current state of the labs that are there. Um, Additionally, I recorded some videos on providing tutorials for some basic topics and things like that. Um, and just overall, I want to improve student comprehension for the class. Go to the next one. So what is process control? More or less, it dictates anything that we want to change conceptually. Um, if you take the idea of a laundry machine, um, when you put your laundry in and turn it on, it runs for a certain amount of time and then it turns off and whether or not you put in the right amount of soap or the right amount of, or the right amount of clothes or sorted everything, it's done. Your clothes might be clean, they might not. That's what we call an open loop system, something that has a defined input and a defined output and some process that happens in between. Um, on the left-hand side, you see this uh, car. Cruise control is another example of process control and control theory in general. When you turn on cruise control and set a speed for your car to go, you do not want your car to just hammer on the accelerator until you hit that speed and then immediately let off the gas and constantly accelerate and decelerate around that speed. You want to approach it gently and then stay at that speed. What process control allows you to do is measure the speed your car is going at and respond to that by appro uh, appropriately responding with a certain amount of gas. Um, that's an example of a closed loop circuit. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is a graphic model of those two ideas that I just described. As you can see on the top, we have the open loop model with an input, a process, and an output. And on the bottom, we have a closed loop model with an input, a process, an output, and feedback that returns to the process that is measuring our output. Now, both of these concepts are what we call single input, single output systems that only measure one thing and only give us one thing out. But a lot of systems are more complex than that such as a robotic arm with six degrees of freedom 
that you want to control all at once. That's kind of a mess if you want to make six different systems that are all constantly changing with these open and closed loop models. So we have an idea that we call the state space model that allows us to control a multiple input, multiple output system using a uh, matrix, more or less, uh, that corresponds to each of the individual values that we're measuring. Um, these concepts are all the sort of thing that we address in the process control class. And as I assume you can imagine, it gets pretty complex as you dig into it. There's a lot of material and we want to have students comprehend it. So go to the next slide. To prepare myself for addressing this, I did a lot of research. Um, this is a list of a bunch of textbooks and one website. Uh, the eight textbooks are uh, things that we built the course material out of originally. And the top one is the required student source material. Uh, below that top one, there's also the required textbook for electrical networks. Um, at the very bottom, that website is an example of one of the federal grants that went to a university for developing instructional, instructional material about this subject. All of these sort of informed me on my uh, journey to figure this out. And then on top of that, I utilized four different kinds of software to develop the supporting material for these labs. With MATLAB, I created mathematical simulations of different uh, processes. With LabVIEW, I, we allow students to graphically program and then uh, utilize real world things like motors that can give us uh, process control systems in real time. Um, and then multi-sim for circuit simulation, which is the electrical network side of things. And Simulink for graphical simulation, which is the sort of thing that I showed you before with the input process and output. So as an example of what I actually developed, I'm going to run you through what a lab would look like as a student goes through it. Um, you would start off with something like this. This is a multi-sim circuit that you're measuring an input voltage and an output voltage on a first order circuit. Um, this inductor in the middle here is the only complex part of the circuit that is actually modifying anything. So as students sort of go through this section and take readings from it, this ties in the information from the previous classes and allows them to sort of connect concepts as they begin to get into it. Then students will go into a MATLAB example where they explore the mathematical concepts behind the purpose of the individual lab. In this case, they're modeling the exact same circuit that, they that was on the last slide, but it exclusively in mathematical terms. Uh, the middle equation here is a model of the exact circuit that I just showed. Um, and this allows them to see how changing different aspects of that circuit will modify how the circuit responds to an input. Uh, and then finally, students will create a LabVIEW program that allows them to control an actual uh, motor in real life and get an output from it. Uh, in this case, it's a model of exactly the same equation and the first two things just presented in a different way. Before, students would only have this be told to, be, to get an output, and that would be the goal of the lab, which does not really connect the ideas very well and sort of leaves you hanging as you go into the next lab. In this way, you can prepare students to not only understand this subject, but understand the subjects to come and sort of prepare them and give them a form to approach the lab. So the reason this works is it is a lot more intuitive than just throwing a student into the deep end. Um, it, is, it corresponds more with the previous material and provides a, a bit of footwork for them, a bit of groundwork for them to uh, develop their knowledge as they move forward. It's more comprehensive. It covers more facets of the subject. Uh, it is simpler than what we currently have. I rewrote the lab specifically to refer to terms in the textbook and to equations that the curriculum uses instead of just having abstract constants. Um, and it is also more reasonable to complete in the time that is provided during the course. Um, so I have more or less done this for about half of the class currently with the labs that we have. I believe there's 15 or 16 labs total in that class. Um, and all of them sort of build upon each other and are intertwined in very um, complex conceptual ways. So it was difficult to find a starting place to work from. But uh, with the 
groundwork that I have laid for the class, I believe that my department will be able to provide a better offering in the future for students and professors um, with the supporting tools that I've developed and the framework for approaching labs in the future. I think that all of these things will lead to um, not only a better understanding of the subject, but better equipped students moving into their respective fields. Um, I believe that is all. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation and for sort of the framework you provided. This might be a little bit beyond the scope of your project, but um, have there been ways that you've started to collect data from the students that have experienced these labs? Um, and if not, are there sort of other ways that you know from the student perspective how they're perceiving these labs? Thank you. So that, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. Um, I have presented similar to this multiple times to my senior class throughout this year and gotten feedback as I've been developing this sort of framework for labs. Um, what works, what, is, what seems like would be useful, and what would be um, most helpful for them moving forward while also teaching the ideas as completely as possible. Um, I've also worked with some students who uh, were unable to complete the class uh, last time it was offered and sort of helped them as I, and they have in turn helped me as I've been developing these labs. It has allowed me to um, sort of gain an idea of what the most problematic concepts are and how to address those. So I do not have like statistical data right now, but I have received feedback from numerous students about what works. Right, if there are any other questions, I'd love to answer them. If not, do uh, you have one? Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aiden. I'll go ahead and introduce Kevin next while he's getting his presentation up. Kevin Lomax is going to be presenting why smartphones are so difficult to repair and what we can do about it. Well, I guess I get to start a little bit early, but my presentation is about smartphones and typically about how difficult they are to repair and why they are that way, how companies are leading and causing these issues to become prevalent and what we can do about it. Uh, obviously, we have used smartphones for such a long time. We've usually grown up with them for many college students and they become an important part of our lives. So it is very important to understand why this happens. Typically, when we use smartphone, uh, there's circumstances where they break. We drop it on the floor. It's not protected. Over time, the screen cracks or other things happen. Uh, this is the process that usually happens when a smartphone breaks. So, for example, you drop your phone. The screen breaks. The repair is appraised at $329. And for most people, this isn't very reasonable. And they don't want to repair an older phone if it's gonna cost that much. So they opt to upgrade to the next device and typically being upsold to a higher end device than what they really need. 
They may want the new iPhone 13 Pro Max or whatever the case may be. So it definitely is a bad cycle for the consumer. And there's four main effects I'm going to talk about in the next slide. The four main effects is obviously monetary loss. When you buy a new phone, you're losing the value of your old phone. It likely is broken to the point you can't resell it. It also is relatively expensive with them being around a thousand or more dollars. Uh, you have guiltiness over breaking the component. If you dropped it, you kind of feel bad about it and there's not really much you can do. And you're likely locked into a contract for at least two years. Having this kind of contract is very stressful, especially if you're a college student and you're paying for your own phone, things like that. Uh, there's also general sustainability concerns. Smartphones are very bad for the environment, as is all technology in general. But smartphones are one of the things that we replace the most frequently. It also is the most costly to the environment itself. And then finally, for the next device, people are usually overly cautious, which leads to more monetary loss, which we'll talk to you in the next slide. With this, there are some benefits for the manufacturer. Uh, the main one I want to talk about for regarding the overcautiousness is extended warranty purchases. If you break your phone, you're likely to be more inclined to want to get a warranty than you would typically even if it is going to you know, cost more to you yourself. And there's other benefits as well for manufacturers and retailers in this case. Uh, it increased sales. It also, or you're more likely to be upsold by retailers when you go to uh, you know, a Sprint or other, other uh, carrier, for example. You may also be sold on the Apple Watch or the AirPods or the AirTags, whatever new accessory is big and hot right now. You typically are upsold to these devices within a package or within a sale for, you know, the reason to increase sales for the companies. And there are certain methods. I'm not picking on Apple specifically. Few of these functions usually are used by other phone manufacturers, but Apple is just the most prevalent example of this. Uh, so the things that most phone, or phone companies use is sealing their phones with glue, which is for usually water resistance. And also, they typically glue in the batteries for not really much of a good reason. They kind of do it just so you can't repair it and that you can't replace it. Uh, and these functions greatly reduce repairability because once you open your phone, which is typically hard, you need a heat gun and a pry and all these other things. Typically, it makes it so it's not water resistant anymore. So you can't even use the device the same you did previously, which is pretty difficult for consumers. Uh, there are also some things Apple is specifically known for. So in the picture there, there are a few types of screws. The Torx screws is a standard used in most small electronics. And on the right is the pentalobe screw, which was designed specifically by Apple for their devices. These are not used in any other phone or any other device, and they are sold in different sizes. So you can't use them across all your iPhones. Typically, they're only for one specific iPhone or for different size ranges, depending on the device. They also use software locks. So if you switch components between devices, even if they're the exact same model, you buy them from the exact same Apple store, sometimes they won't work. They will just simply choose not to work, even though they're the exact same silicon. And then there is the spare components being driven out of the open market. So Apple is known for having NDAs with their manufacturers and other people that create their phones to prevent them from being sold on the open market leading to increased repair costs because no one can really produce these parts. There's also the environmental harm that many people are concerned with. Uh, one smartphone during manufacturing alone produces 55 kilograms or 125 pounds of carbon per device. So think about the number of people in this room, that's a huge amount of weight just from manufacturing and that doesn't even consider the end of life. So for example, in 2015, we, the U.S. produced 3.1 million tons of uh, electronic waste, which is about 270 Eiffel Towers. Wait, what? Which is a large amount, obviously. And the way we dispose of the electronics isn't sustainable in the slightest because we typically are using mass burnings or acid baths that poison the community that we send them to. So they typically are poisoning their foods they're poisoning their lungs. They have higher cancer rates, higher mortality rates. All these things cause just because we don't care where our electronics go after we're done with them. So there's this thing called right to repair. This movement that many people probably know about, it started in the automotive industry 
And it spans many industries from like agricultural with John Deere to like medical supplies and other, you know, electronics, for example. And this movement is meant to allow people to repair their own devices or their own items they own, which likely is very reasonable to have. But many manufacturers are using these practices, like creating their own specialty screws to make it so you can't do this. And they make it so as hard as possible to repair their device. And the primary goal for right to repair is just to allow people to repair them. Uh, ultimately, right to repair is trying to limit the amount of unrepairable design, such as gluing the phone shut, using special screws, things like that. But right now, the legislation is hard to pass in many states and to pass federally especially. So it is a bit difficult to get this to pass. And during an interview in July that I had with Louis Rosman, who is a right to repair activist and also owns his own repair shop in New York, uh, we talked about what his view on right to repair is and what he is the primary concern, which was the inaccessibility to schematics and spare parts. So this typically has to do because of the restrictions for manufacturers to supply repair components with his devices. And also the software limitations I spoke about earlier with components not working for basically no reason. There has been some progress with right to repair, however. In Washington state, we first started having right to repair legislation every year from 2017, 2018 legislation year forward. And we currently have a bill in the house that is trying to get passed. Um, and there's a small site there if you wanna support that. And also federally, there has been some progress in July. Uh, the FTC delivered a 56 page report to the US Congress about irreparable design, citing people like Apple and John Deere. And also Biden tasked the FTC to make guidelines for repair standards in electronic manufacturing. So there's more progress federally recently than there has been in our state but we are still pushing for right to repair here as well. So here we're gonna talk about some companies to support if, because it might take a while for right to repair to pass. Uh, it's a bit unrealistic because we have so many lobbyists for these large companies. There are some companies here, uh, Framework Laptop, even though we're talking most about smartphones, is a very good example of a sustainable and a modular design company. Uh, they create laptops, as you'd imagine, and they, gained support through crowdfunding and they were created by engineers who were passionate about repair with these kind of devices. And then there's also Fairphone who's unfortunately only sold in Europe. They don't have any US cellular uh, compatibility, but they also have a very strong modular design with relatively low prices. And they also started as a social initiative for uh, the supply chain with smartphones, which is why they have more of a unique perspective and a more holistic approach to their design. And here's an example of how electronics could look. So on the left is the framework laptop I just discussed. And on the right is the new M1 MacBook Pro. Obviously the MacBook Pro, it's a little more sleek. Everything is all blacked out and all that. But on the left, I'd like you to notice that there are specific QR codes on each of the components, giving you a way to repair them. It gives you a video, a tutorial, and where to buy the part. So it is simple enough that most people can open up these devices and replace a battery or a Wi-Fi module or their own storage or RAM. And these things are relatively easy to repair in general. And the difference between this and what Apple does, almost everything is soldered on or very difficult to take off with M1 MacBook Pro. And showing the difference here is why this is so important because it, this device isn't much bigger than the MacBook. And it also has so much more capabilities and future proofing that you're able to, as the device ages, progressively change what you need to, to make it function as you need. And after that, any questions for me? Thanks, Kevin. Um, do you have any data over an average person's lifespan, how many smartphones they churn through and how we could bring that number down using right to repair? So on average, smartphones are used for about three years. Uh, this equates to about 16 to 20 phones during the lifespan, typically more towards the 20 range. 
Uh, so this, with the five, 55 kilogram statistic for the device produced in manufacturing, it's a very high number. And if you simply just extend the use phase of a smartphone by one year, you go from 20 devices down to 16. If you think, consider the thousand dollars per device and also the dramatic cost with the production of CO2 and also the e-waste, uh, it definitely is easy to bring down if you can just extend it one more year which is not a very hard ask in my opinion. Uh, did you find any information on why Apple is able to rig these, these devices? Basically rig them into the point where you can't fix them and all that stuff. So the main way is because there's no regulation for preventing them from doing so kind of more because they can. Uh, they slowly have become less repairable as time has gone on. Uh, they didn't really have any incentive not to. And the reason why they do make it more repairable or less repairable is just for their own benefit. Like I said, to try to increase sales. Uh, we should be able to stop them, but we can't due to the power they have. And with some social pushback, they recently have gotten a bit better. They are starting their own repair bar for their devices uh, with the Genius Bars and things like that where you can repair your phones and your laptops for yourself. I'm not sure how extensive that will be, but it is at least progress, but mostly just because no one has stopped them, unfortunately. Yeah, oh, yeah you can do it. We're the last ones, but you might as well. You had a long day. <laughs> All right, thank you. For our last speaker for this session, speakers, plural, sorry, um, is Hui and Kyler. Where are you? There you are, Kyler, Joel, and Dylan. And they're going to be presenting on innovative design and construction of a net zero energy and solar powered house. Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Hui Nguyen. Today I'm presenting with Joel. Kyler and Dylan, and we are CW Solar Cats. And this is our Solar Decathlon Build Challenge project. We also have uh, Dr. Hong Tao Dang, Professor uh, Derry Furman, as the faculty lead and faculty advisor from Construction Management Program. Uh, this is a chart of our team roster with everyone's role and responsibility. And for the uh, project summary, the project is uh, at the uh, in is in Allensburg, Washington. Uh, Net Zero Steel Art Building was our intent to build this project from the beginning. The footprints of the project is barely over three thousand square feet. Uh, comparing to the traditional residential lumber house, we use forty percent less than power consumption with a uh, fifty percent water reduction because we planning to use low flow fixtures. And uh, for the construction material waste, we will be using less than 90% comparing to the typical home. The time to build this project is just one third of the time to build residential house. And the cost is about 40% less than the typical home. And the more important thing, there will be no maintaining cost in the future because of the material sustainability and uh, durability. Next up, the project is called Tyler Resident with two, two steel art buildings, one uh, used for living quarters and one used, uh, one used for garage and shop. The first half of the building is 1,800 square feet uh, with one kitchen, one master bedroom with bathroom attached and three additional bedrooms, one kitchen and one living area. The second half of the building is uh, used for garage and shop with uh, 1,500 square feet with its own bathroom, two garage, and one uh, space for garage uh, for storage loft and water treatment equipment for uh, well system. Next up, I will pass this on my partner, Kyler. Hey everybody, I'm Kyler. First off, I want to talk about the benefits of steel construction. These steel structures are very resilient to all climates. Um, here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, homes are very prone to be exposed to wildfires, termites, mold, and a couple other things. 
Steel structures have resistance to all of these, which makes the longevity of the homes extremely high in comparison to other types of construction. Along with the structure's impressive longevity, they also, this also has an open floor design and is trust free. Uh, this allows the building to be very versatile in function, it can be used for agricultural, residential, and commercial purposes. <clears throat> with all these features combined, uh, these steel structures are a very viable solution uh, to all international housing problems. So these steel arches are made from heavy gauge, corrosion resistant galvalume steel. This steel is like steel but has a high percentage of aluminum in the mix. Uh, so this creates basically a smooth finish compared to other steel. Uh, and this is due to the visible crystals decreasing in size. Adding on to that, steel structures, these steel structures are prefabricated in shop made specifically for your project. So they all come pre-cut and pre-drilled. So this creates a very smooth and easy assembly process. Since this structure has no span and stress-free, again, uh, most of the construction is done right on the ground. There's no need uh, for any heavy machinery or equipment. This included with no construction waste can help save on construction time and cost. This unique steel arch building can intrigue a large audience, one being that is made of recyclable materials, creating an eco-friendly home, while also catching the interests of individuals who live in a climate with natural disasters, <clears throat> as this home is suitable for these types of climates. Overall, when you put everything together, uh, the audience that this house targets, those that want to protect the environment uh, and make a positive change in the world, or individual individuals who are looking for a resilient home that has a, a long, long, or is a longevity. And next, Joel. Hey, everybody. My name is Joel. Um, so me and uh, Dylan worked on the 3D uh, ribbon model. Um, as you can see, it's uh, two-sided. Uh, uh, so here's the garage, and then uh, here's the living quarters. Um, this is the back view, so you can see that it has a overhead door for the cars, um, a single door there for the shop. And then the, the door here leads into the master uh, bedroom, and uh, we have a balcony on the second floor loft. And then we also have a uh, shipping container here where our um, customer currently lives. They're just kind of waiting for us to uh, build the, the home until they, you know, they can occupy it. And then uh, we plan to have the solar panels on top of it. Here's the front view, um, garage again, uh, two overhead doors, uh, one sliding door here that's for the um, guest bedroom. And then uh, here's the main entry here to the home. Uh, we also have the Gabion wall here. Uh, you can't see it too well, but there is a hot tub in front of it. So the main uh, reason why we put the Gabion there is just to kind of like protect it from the wind. Like you guys know, you know, Ellensburg's pretty windy, so how to protect it there. And then uh, we also have a uh, astral turf here. Here's a bird's eye view. Uh, we kind of just took off the arc on the home. And uh, yeah, you can see like, you know, the, the bedrooms, the master bedroom, the loft here. That's where like the, you know, they play, uh, they kind of play games like pool or something like that. Um, then we have here in the garage, we also have another uh, guest bedroom. The, here's the restroom. And here, uh, all the musical instruments will be um, placed since the owner, like, I think they play the piano, I believe. I'm not sure, but yeah, they wanted it to be right there. Here's an interior view, as if you're standing in the living room. Um, you know, the guest bedroom here, master bedroom here, and the kitchen here. So one of the goals was uh, to achieve net zero. Uh, we plan to use 1,000 kilowatt um, hours per month. This will, uh, on the exterior of the, of the home, we will have a closed cell spray foam and fire resistive paint. Um, the foam is uh, rated R38. And then on the end walls, we'll also have another um, wall there. And that would be uh, constructed out of a stainless, uh, steel and um, rigid insulation on the rigid insulation. Um, these walls have a combined uh, R value of R28. Um, throughout the home, we'll have uh, LED lights, um, low water uh, flow fixtures, high efficiency energy star appliances, electric car charging station the solar array on-site uh, mini split si system and on-demand hot water. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Dylan. Thank you, Joel. So the solar decathlon uh, challenge is actually a competition that we compete with other universities. And some of the things we're graded on is the architecture, the engineering, the market analysis, 
the durability and resilience, and as well as the embodied environmental impact. So for the architecture, what we decided to do is we to build a unique home. So as you can see, it's very arched, you know. Uh, and these arches are made out of steel, just like my buddy Kyler mentioned. For the engineering, we're using solar panels to power our house. And the market analysis, being that it's very easy to construct, is that makes it faster, therefore cheaper as well. And the beautiful thing about this layout is that it could be manipulated. So you could change the size, the length, the height, whatever you like. Um, as mentioned before, it's very durable and resilient because it is weatherproof, basically, termite proof um, and fireproof. The environmental impact where we hit this section here is that most of this material is actually prefabricated, so that equals less waste. Something else that we are measured on is the integrated performance, the occupant experience, the comfort, environmental quality, and energy performance. So for the integrated performance, that just means like what we can do to help it be more efficient. And one thing we did was orient the house so that it receives the most natural sunlight. Uh, the gabions actually that my buddy Joel mentioned around the hot tub are actually being made out of rock that we find in the area. For the occupant experience, our owners are um, a little older, for lack of better words. And so we want to make it ADA compliant because they plan on retire there. Uh, we also be using a mini split system for temperature control. And lastly, the solar solar panels are actually be measured so that we know how much we're using and how efficient we're using them. So in conclusion, uh, we just told you everything about our materials and how they're very durable and resilient. So they're faster to build, like I mentioned before, making them cheaper. The goal here is to really revolutionize this design so that we can make these homes everywhere around the world. Thank you. Any questions? You mentioned going and potentially competing. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about what your plans are there or and or if you uh, have already competed. Yeah, so this is an ongoing competition. We started this about um, a year ago. Oh, yeah, last fall. So we just got the notice to proceed, which means that we're going to get funding for this design. Um, the only thing we're waiting on really is for the well to be found, really, so that we can then proceed with construction. So all these designs and everything we talked about has already been accepted. And the competition will end, I believe, the following year, which unfortunately we will not be here anymore, but we help get this jump started. Thank you so much for coming and presenting and telling us about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome to our computer science presentation. Uh, my name is Dr. Rogan Cleavy. I'm going to be moderating this session, and we are ready to get going uh, with Chris Ricotto, or sorry, Charles Ricardo, and he's going to be presenting on interpretable machine learning for self-service high-risk decision making. Hello, I'm Charles Ricardo, and I'm a graduate student at CWU. My graduate major is computational science. Uh, my advisor is Dr. Boris Kovalerchuk, and my presentation is on interpretable machine learning for self-service high-risk decision-making. So today's agenda, we'll, we'll go, first go over the motivation, the problem statement, the research methods, and then the uh, just kind of snapshot of the software. So for 
the motivation um, machine learning is constantly being used in um, the, the decision-making process. Um, we're taking the decision-making from the human capability and we're putting it to the machine. So we're developing self-driving cars and, or if we want to run a risk assessment for someone for say an insurance company, they'll uh, have a model do it. And so we want to be able to kind of understand those models that are being used better. And machine learning algorithms, they can be complex and consider a black box to the end user. Um, this is dependent on exactly who the end user is. People with more uh, tech technical depth into the model, it won't be as um, much as a black box to someone who is outside of that uh, model creation. And then the end user has to trust possible assumptions that were used in the algorithm uh, process, development process, such as uh, certain distance distance metrics. Like if you're if you have a descriptive attribute that's based off color, and you're somehow doing a arithmetic operation between, uh, say, a, a size, and you know size will be say a centimeter unit, and then color is just the color. So you might have an RGB value. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to calculate distance between those, but it's something to be aware of. So the pro problem statement is the evaluation of machine learning models. Uh, their accuracy can often be exaggerated from common uh, techniques we use to measure the model accuracy. Uh, we usually use cross-validation, which takes 10. Uh, so if we use a 10-fold cross-validation, it takes 10 random splits of an entire data set and one split is put into validation and the nine other splits are trained. And then it gives you accuracy for that one split. And then for the next split, it puts that split into a validation set. And then the, nine, the remain nine splits are tested against that. So you'll get 10 model accuracies and they're averaged. And generally that's your uh, overall model accuracy. Uh, but we wanna know how the model is gonna do when we find the worst split. And we wanna compare that to the to the that average accuracy. And this can be important for applications that have a high cost of uh, error. So like tumor diagnosis or say uh, missile um, testing, uh, high risk investing. And our goal is to develop, to solve this problem, our goal is we wanna develop a visually interpretable a model and we wanna use this visual knowledge discovery on that model to improve our critical decision-making process. So these two plots, one is, um, a, the first one is a parallel coordinate plot. It's a one-dimensional plot where each line, so it's one dimension, so it's a line. So each line represents an attribute. And then we have a sequence of lines uh, for each attribute. And then our figure on the, the left, left-hand side is, the, is a two-dimensional plot. So now, instead of having one attribute per line, we have an attribute on the y-axis, and we have an attribute on the x-axis, and then we repeat our two-dimensional plots in a sequence, depending on how many attributes we have of that data set. So uh, from these plots, we developed a new system called dynamic scaffolding coordinates. And what we do is we make scaffolds from the origin of each uh, pair of axes to the point. And then we connect those scaffolds uh, together. And then we remove the, the very first scaffold. And th this creates our, uh, our dynamic scaffolding plot. And the great thing about this is, is we're now we're able to introduce the plot to only two, two to, or two set of, or one set of axes. And uh, we can still represent each attribute individually. And uh, to make, the plot, so the plot can be kind of messy and we wanna reduce the amount of overlap within a plot. So what we do is we find these important attributes, which I'll go over later how we find them. And we put them at the beginning of our order and we make them really big. And then uh, for preceding ones, we uh, reduce the attribute size. So by doing that, we're able to highlight kind of exactly where there's overlap between classes in a model uh, where we'll have a, where models will have a hard time determining which sample belongs to which class. So in this box, we have a mixture of green and blue classes. And while we can see it's green and blue, a model might not know they're, they're 
color yet. So some of those green will be classified as blue and some of those blue will be classified as green. Uh, so for reducing overlap, we employ three uh, methods. We have hyperblock analysis from decision tree. And if that's uh, not enough to get help us find important attributes, we create important attributes for us. So uh, we'll use uh, mapped dimensional reduction techniques. And what I mean by mapped is that you can take unseen data and you can use your, your dimensional reduction technique model on that un unseen data. And then we have uh, the, a non-preserving dimensional reduction technique, but that can only be used on the training data. And if you wanna incorporate test data, you have to redo the whole dimensional reduction with the test and training data together. So hyperblocks, they're, they're a kind of like a, a cube in multi-dimensional space and hyper uh, just refer, refers to something that's in multiple dimensions. So if you have a, a sphere in multiple dimensions, you call it a hypersphere. And uh, so it, like a rectangle or like a cube, you have your length, width and height. So for our multi-dimensional cubes, we kind of just have a length in each dimension. So if we have a 10 dimensional hypercube, we'll have 10 lengths. And uh, one way to find these, cube, these uh, hyper blocks in a data set is to use a decision tree and each kind of decision in the rule um, tells us the length of a side. So just looking at this uh, picture, uh, the X2 attribute, um, it would make, it would make a cube length, it would make, it, it spawns two cubes. So we're saying the very first, the parent of the tree is one cube, and then it can split into two new cubes. And the one cube will have on the uh, attribute X2 will have a, a length between zero and 2.45. And then the other cube will have a, a length of 2.45 and greater. And so now to apply our new plot and our, uh, hyperblock analysis to different data sets. We take the seeds data set, it's 210 samples uh, each class. There's three classes of seeds and they have 70 samples each. Uh, first, we visualize it on our standard uh, parallel coordinate and shifted paired coordinate plots. And we can see there's a lot of overlap. So we look to the decision tree and this kind of gives us an idea of what our important attributes are gonna be to put at the, the front of our attribute order. And uh, uh, these are good attributes because of how much class separation they cause. So for the green class, already with just one attribute, where we can separate 68 out of 70 samples and we'll only have one misclassification. And similarly for the red set, we'll be able to reduce it to 55 out of 70 and then we'll have two misclassifications. And then the blue hyperblock is a little bit more messy. It has 14 samples from the lead the red class, but it has 70 from the blue class. And so when we apply our, uh, our new coordinate system and we do our attribute scaling, uh, where we really greatly emphasize those first two attributes from the decision tree, uh, we're able to better see uh, where our data set will have overlapping classes, which would be difficult for any machine learning model to kind of uh, uh, put in the correct class. And so we find these areas of overlap. And when we wanna make our worst uh, validation split, we take those in those rectangles, we'll take those samples and we'll put them into our validation set. And then the rest of the samples will remain in the training set. So if you're doing, if you're comparing your, model, your worst case split uh, to tenfold cross validation, you would, just, you, would, you would just pick samples until you get 10%. And if you don't have 10% inside the rectangles, you just have to start making decisions of extra samples you think uh, might lower the, the accuracy. So for the worst case split for the seeds, um, we found that the average accuracy uh, using 10K fold cross validation was 30 to 66% higher than our selected samples from the previous slide. Uh, and then additionally, we found that for 10, if we only ran 10 fold cross validation, our support vector machine model would have been, may have been our choice because it had the highest uh, classification accuracy. But when we looked at the worst performance of each model, random forest uh, actually had the highest accuracy. So if you're making a, a high risk decision where uh, the model behaving at your worst, it, where the model behaving at its worst is something you 
you're, you want to be aware of, it'd be beneficial to include both models. Next, we look at the Wisconsin breast cancer data set. Um, it, it has, it tries, it's a data set that includes both benign and malignant tumors. And this is important to us because uh, you would not want to misdiagnose a malignant tumor as benign because then the patient won't get the correct treatment. And so this is a tree, you, you shouldn't, it's going to be small, so I say don't read it. And the, but the point is I'm trying to show is the, the really large trees that takes a really a lo large amount of decisions to classify each sample because they're highly overlapped. Um, we have to use a, a, a new technique. We can't uh, immediately pull out uh, appropriate hyperblocks. And so with this, uh, we, we make our new attributes and we use uh, dimensional reduction techniques to two dimensions. Uh, here I use principal component analysis to reduce uh, down to two dimensions. So I have a scatter plot of just my two principal components, but then from the scatter plot, I grow out our our, our plot that we created, our dyna dynamic scaffolding plot. We we grow those polylines outside out of the the scatter plot from the PCA components, and now we can see the Wisconsin breast cancer data set a lot better. We can see the malignant cases are up at the top, and they're really large, and the benign cases are small, and it's easy easier for the individual to select cases that would make the lower the model accuracy. So similar to the seed set, uh, we tested against 10-fold uh, cross-validation, and we found that 10-fold cross-validation had uh, accuracy results that were 25 to 35% higher than the worst-case uh, estimate. And we also found that uh, while Knair's neighbors uh, was the best model for uh, K-fold cross-validation, 10-fold cross-validation, we found that actually for the worst case that Naive Bayes uh, was the highest by a considerable amount by uh, 7% um, between the second place. So as again, if you're doing tumor diagnosis, it might be helpful to use both k nearest neighbors and Naive Bayes. And finally, uh, so our last, um, my, our last test we're doing with uh, the MNIST handwritten digits data set, it's uh, 28 by 28 pixel images which makes 784 attributes. So it's a lot of attributes. So I have to reduce them to uh, using dimensional, uh, dimensional reduction techniques. So I reduce them to 50 singular, uh, singular value decom decomposition components. And from there, I reduce it further to two uh, uh, T distributes, stochastic neighbor embedding components. And uh, this is 60,000 samples. So we have 60,000 dots in there. Um, a lot of them are close, so they're kind of overlapped. And these are 10 digits, and each cl cluster is one digit. So TSNE is really great at creating uh, separate clusters for each digits. The only problem is uh, TSNE in itself can be considered a black box model. So we don't necessarily want to use TSNE, but for very complex data sets, uh, it, it works really well. And then the figure, uh, the figure next to the scatter plot is when we grow our scaffold lines. And I have to make the scaffold lines on the attribute scaling. I have to make them really small or else they'll grow on top of each other. But um, it kind of just shows each digit really well clustered. And then, uh, so the, the final two slides are my, just my software. Uh, I just provide some screenshots to kind of show what we can do with it. And uh, the we have the ability to kind of get information from the class, like how many attributes are, how many samples, how many uh, classes, how many samples per class. Uh, we can make four different plots. We can make our scaffolding plots, our parallel coordinate plot, and our shifted pair coordinate plot. Uh, we have the ability to hide individual classes, uh, hide their marker locations. Uh, we can reorder classes. Like if they're, these ones are separated, but sometimes you have classes on top of each other. So if you want to see what classes underneath, you can reorder classes. You can reorder attributes. You can uh, you can highlight individual attributes. Um, and so this is just kind of showing it zoomed in. You can zoom in in real time because it uses OpenGL. It pushes all the vert text information to the graphic card, which is, makes it really fast to render. Um, so the picture I have is about um, 4 million da data points. And you can, in real time, you can zoom in and you can drag and kind of look at, uh, if you want to look at certain structures in your image.
uh, wrap up this next one. And any questions? There's not really anyone here. Right, so the benefit for ts &E is, as I said, it's, it's more so that we can't, with our methods right now, we can't create a clean visualization to find with our hyperblock method or our more traditional dimensional, our more traditional dimensional reduction techniques like singular value decomposition or uh, multidimensional uh, scaling. We can't use, even applying those techniques, we still can't create a, uh, a highly visualized clarity plot for the end user to find samples. So we, we, that's why we employ ts and &E, which is considered a black box model because it's, it, for now, it's the best we have to uh, classify results. But in a perfect world, we would, we'd only use hyperblocks. We'd only use the data set itself. We wouldn't want to create extra um, attributes. 